Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now that an intuitive machines and Nova Sea Lander has gone to sleep on the moon, there is much talk about how to do better next time. But I, on the other hand, would like to go back in time and look at how the US did it right the first time with Surveyor. Planning for the Surveyor spacecraft started in the 1950s. At that point, NASA had st just been formed and they were launching like the Pioneer spacecraft past the moon. They were working on a series of spacecraft called Ranger, which might soft land on the moon. But Surveyor was going to be the flagship mission of the 1960s, a whole army of space probes equipped with the latest in scientific instruments which could land on the moon and do real science on the surface. But of course, things didn't work out that way. Because when JFK committed the US to landing a man on the moon and returning them, Surveyor went from being the main attraction to being a precursor to the Apollo missions. The most important question that needed to be answered was, could you actually land on the moon? Now, the Ranger spacecraft in 1964 gave America its first close-up looks at the surface. These were impactors, though. They were transmitting images as they descended towards the surface, and we got an idea of how the features scaled uh, as you got closer. But scientists and engineers really wanted to make sure that when you got down to the surface, that it wasn't covered in massive boulders with no place to put a spacecraft. And... There were those who argued that dust would be accumulated from space and absent the kind of forces that we have on Earth in terms of gravity and atmosphere and erosion, this dust would form into an ultra-fine uh, liquid fluid on the surface so that if you tried to land a spacecraft on it, you would literally sink into it. And Arthur C. Clarke wrote a story called A Fall of Moon Dust, which uh, worked on this idea. So the US absolutely needed to have these robotic precursor missions before they could risk putting people on the surface of the moon. But they didn't need them to bring a complicated suite of scientific instruments when you would have astronauts who could just pick up rocks and bring them home. So when Surveyor 1 was being developed for launch, it was pretty much an engineering model. Most of the instrumentation on it was designed to measure the performance of the vehicle, measure its temperatures and its accelerations and send that back. The one real scientific instrument was a TV camera, which would of course be used to photograph the surface and build mosaics, giving uh, the mission planners an idea of what the surface actually looked like up close. But ignoring the lack of scientific payload, Surveyor was the most advanced lunar spacecraft of its day. It was a tetrahedral shaped structure built of tubular aluminium. It was 27 kilograms just for the basic structure. Uh, it was about 2.4 meters tall. Each of the corners had legs that folded out with nice you know, shock absorbing foot pads on it. When the legs were fully deployed, it would be 4.3 meters across, giving a nice low center of mass for stability. In the middle, a post extended upwards with a solar panel and a high gain antenna, which could be pointed at the sun and the earth. There were three engines, which were bipropellant thrusters burning monomethyl hydrazine and uh, nitrogen tetroxide, an attitude control system that used uh, compressed nitrogen, a primitive computer that would coordinate everything, a star tracker to track attitude in flight, and a radar system for landing on the moon. And finally, in the middle, a Star 37 solid rocket motor. This would be two-thirds of the vehicle mass, and it would only operate for 40 seconds, reducing the velocity by about 2.5 kilometers per second on final approach to the moon. The launch vehicle would be the Atlas Centaur, which was still very much in development while they were working on this. One of the features they hoped to exploit was the ability to relight the Centaur in space. That would enable the payload to go into a parking orbit and then commence its translunar injection. Without this, they would only be able to reach the moon when it was south of the equator. And so for early surveyor missions, only the direct launch method was available. So the spacecraft would be placed on a direct trajectory to the moon to impact the lunar surface. It wasn't going to go into orbit. It was going to go straight down and perform the classic suicide burn landing. There's no hazard avoidance capability. This was the 1960s. So the way this works is that as the spacecraft gets to within a few hundred kilometers of the surface, it's commanded to orient the spacecraft away from the moon and then a radar is turned on. And this radar is called the Altitude Marking Radar. 
and it's only used very early on. What it is, it's actually built inside the nozzle of that central rocket motor. And all it's doing is it's sending out a pulse and it's waiting to get within 60 kilometers of the lunar surface. And once it gets there, it sends a signal and the computer initiates the landing sequence. Firstly, it ignites the three small vernier thrusters. These can generate anything from 13 to 40 kilograms of thrust. And they can control the attitude by uh, adjusting the throttle on each of these. And then there's one engine which can also rotate so that it can actually provide a roll control. Once those are lit, they then ignite the Star 37, which provides something like four tons of thrust for 40 seconds. And of course, as it's doing this, it completely obliterates that altitude marking radar, which was built into the nozzle. But that's fine because there's a completely separate radar that's needed for the final landing. That's the radar altimeter and Doppler velocity sensor. But that's not going to work just yet because they're too far from the surface. For this initial deceleration burn, the spacecraft is just holding its attitude using its gyroscopes as reference. So after about 40 seconds, that main engine burns out and it's jettisoned. The spacecraft now weighs just over 300 kilograms, including its propellant, and it's descending towards the surface at a rate of about 110 meters per second, 240 miles per hour. It's about 9 kilometers up, 25,000 feet, and over the next few minutes it's going to slow itself down. Now it's going to use that radar system to guide its way to the surface. So this radar system actually uses four different antennas to generate four spot beams. Uh, three of them are measuring velocity, and there's one which is measuring distance. And the way these are distributed is the one that goes straight down the middle of the vehicle, it's measuring uh, the distance, so that's your altitude, your distance to target. And then there's the three other beams are sort of distributed out at 25 degree angles, and these are measuring the velocity. So now you can take two of those beams, and that means their angle is like 50 degrees apart. And if the spacecraft is perfectly aligned along its velocity vector, then these will return the same Doppler shift. But if it's rotated towards one or the other, that the one that's rotated towards will be generating a higher relative velocity, a higher Doppler shift. And so the guidance system needs to rotate towards this until the two velocities are matched. So with three of them, you cover two different rotation axes and it can figure out exactly what way it needs to orient itself so that it can decelerate down. There's no computer or guidance software here. This is just all analog circuits, you know, providing feedback mechanisms which uh, are coordinating this uh, deceleration. Under ideal descent, it would slow down to three and a half miles per hour 13 feet above the surface. That's about 2 meters per second at 4 meters above the surface. And then it would let gravity pull itself down where it would bounce gently, you know, settle itself onto the surface of the moon, hopefully. Surveyor 1 was launched on May 30th, 1966. The engineers who'd worked on it thought there was a reasonable chance that it might make it to the moon, but they weren't prepared to promise because there was all sorts of unanticipated problems that could be encountered on a program that was pushing the limits of technology. One thing they could be certain of was that they were no longer aiming for the honour of being the first to soft land a spacecraft on the moon, since the Soviet's Luna 9 had accomplished that earlier in the year. However, Luna 9 used a system that was wholly inappropriate for the purpose of landing astronauts. It had a descent stage that hit the surface at uh, about 50 miles an hour, and the lander on the front, protected by airbags, would bounce around on the surface until it came to a rest, whereupon it would deflate the bags, open its petals, and hopefully be pointed upright. So a few days later, Surveyor 1 would be falling towards the moon, having successfully navigated its way through space without losing control. And to everyone's surprise, it successfully completed the landing on their first attempt. The TV camera system would start downloading images almost immediately, and over the next couple of weeks of activity, it would download thousands of images which could be assembled into panoramas of the lunar surface showing that it was a type of terrain that could be handled and negotiated by humans. As an aside, it's interesting to see how they assembled these panoramas. Obviously, we do this all digitally today, but back then they actually had a spherical surface that they could tile these images onto, which would reflect their orientation on the camera. Surveyor 1 also was robust enough to handle night on the moon, and it woke up again in July. 
Now one thing they didn't know at the time was exactly where it had landed. They knew roughly where it was going, but the exact location, well that would have to actually wait for some really good lunar maps. And that would come a year later from the Lunar Orbiter Project, which was set the task of photographing the moon in detail so that uh, potential landing sites could be identified. And I know that Lunar Orbiter 3 was able to get images of Surveyor 1 on the moon at resolutions of better than one meter. And so I think that's the first time a spacecraft was detected on another planet by another spacecraft. More recently, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was able to get better images. Lunar Orbiter 3 also took a picture of this potential future landing site, which would eventually have Surveyor 3 land in it. But more importantly, Surveyor 3 would be visited by Apollo 12. Surveyor 3 was slightly different than Surveyor 1. Uh, Surveyor 1 had a camera which was designed to capture images during the approach to the moon, but it was decided not to use this because they didn't have enough you know, communications bandwidth at the time. So this was an instrument was mounted, configured, never actually used. By the time of Surveyor 3, it was replaced with a scoop which could reach out onto the lunar surface and move the lunar soil around and get an idea of the consistency of the surface. That scoop and the TV camera would be returned to Earth by the crew of Apollo 12. Surveyor 3 would also be the first spacecraft to take off from the moon. Due to the shape of the terrain, the landing radar and navigation got a little bit confused and the engines kept burning right up to impact. So it immediately lifted off again and it landed again about 20 meters away, took off one more time and finally landed in the crater for a third time. Surveyor 2 had been lost mid-flight when a course correction went wrong. One of the little Vernier engines never fired and the spacecraft spun out of control. Surveyor 4 would also prove to be unlucky. About 30 seconds after the ignition of the solid rocket motor, contact was lost and we don't know what happened. Most likely the casing just ruptured and the vehicle exploded. There's no trace of it on the surface. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has taken many images of the region and it has a resolution of about half a meter. Nothing's turned up, so presumably any wreckage or trace is smaller than that. Even if it didn't explode, it might not have hit the surface with sufficient speed to make a, a mark that was visible from orbit. Surveyor 5 would carry a handful of new instruments. The scoop would be replaced with the alpha scattering experiment. This would be lowered onto the surface of the moon and then a series of radiation sources would bombard the surface of the moon with alpha radiation. The particles would scatter off the material on the surface and uh, be detected by a set of detectors. They weren't just looking at alpha particles, they were also looking for protons that resulted from nuclear reactions. By looking at the direction and the energy from these, they could determine the elemental makeup of the moon. The other experiments were a little simpler. Firstly, they attached some magnets to the feet of the lander, hoping that they would be able to pick up any magnetic materials, which would then be visible in the TV camera. And then a set of mirrors were attached to the landing legs so that the TV camera could point at this mirror and look underneath the lander to see how the thrusters had uh, affected the surface of the moon. But simply getting to the moon would be a challenge for Surveyor 5. After a mid-course correction, they discovered they were losing helium, which was used to pressurize the propulsion system. After crunching the numbers, the engineers realized it would potentially still be possible to land on the moon, but they would have to cut down on the delta V required during the final section. And the way to do this was by reducing gravity losses. So they redesigned the landing trajectory to wait until the absolute last minute and use the maximum thrust possible, doing the classic suicide burn descent. The spacecraft's autonomous landing systems were not designed for this. They had to figure out the exact timing of events and then inject commands sent up from the Earth in real time to make the landing sequence operate as quickly as possible. And when I say real time, remember that you know from the Earth to the Moon is one and a quarter seconds of light travel time. This had to be figured out into the tapes that they planned for this maneuver. So for comparison, normally after the solid motor burns out, they would be nine kilometers from the surface. With this modified plan, they would be 1400 meters from the surface. 
they did make it to the surface and for bonus points after they'd been on the surface for a while they actually relit the engines for half a second and moved the spacecraft about 10 centimeters or four inches which was enough to get more science data from their alpha particle experiment surveyor 6 was targeted at the center of the moon sinus medi this was a region which had also been the target for surveyor 2 and surveyor 4 both of those had failed so this would be the third attempt, and it did come off successfully this time. Surveyor 6 would also perform more post-landing maneuvers. Initially, they were using the attitude control jets to see if they could disturb the lunar surface, but then they fired up the main engines, lifting the spacecraft a few meters above and across the lunar surface to a new location. From there, they were able to look back at where they had lifted off from and see if they had made a crater with the engines but no substantial crater could be found. Surveyor 7 would be the last of the Surveyor missions and it decided to go somewhere completely different. Instead of flat areas, they aimed for lunar highlands, rough terrain, hoping that uh, it would challenge the hardware. This was also the best equipped spacecraft they had built. Carrying both the Alpha Particle Scattering Experiment and the Scoop, it would be able to uh, examine the difference in composition beneath the surface. Surveyor 7 would land on the moon in January of 1968, less than a year before Apollo 8 took humans around the moon for the first time. Out of the seven Surveyor missions, five of them were successful. So for a long time, the US had successfully soft landed more missions with humans on them than robotic missions. It wasn't until last month when the US landed their sixth robotic mission on the moon. And once again, the primary purpose of these new lunar missions are in preparation for humans landing on the surface of the moon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.